called neurodevelop neurodevelopmental disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure. So there's several different diagnoses. These can be caused any time during pregnancy from week one all the way to week 40 plus um, they can be caused and it does not take much alcohol to cause one and it causes a lifelong impact on a variety of different um, cognitive processes, emotional behavioral regulation and other adaptive functions. And then the key here and the reason why it's important for your populations to know this is unidentified and untreated FASD can cause impacts in secondary conditions like uh, juvenile uh, being involved in the juvenile system or um, having to go to an ALE classroom or things like that. Uh, and, and the reason those are those secondary conditions are because the FASD is not identified and not treated appropriately. This is just a quick uh, little image you may have seen when learning about child development, I just wanted to point out, so this, what you're looking at is embryonic and fetal development. And what I, what I want to show here are these bars. Um, the red bars are timing for significant impact on structural differences if alcohol is exposed to them or any other harmful substance. So in other words, starting at week three, all the way to week 16, if alcohol or any other substance is exposed, it can cause the structure itself to be changed. The yellow is high sensitivity for functional differences. So notice this is all the way through pregnancy that the central nervous system, that's our brain, um, is developing. So even if it's not a structural change, it can change the function of how a person thinks and therefore impacts every other aspect of their life. And this goes for all of the systems listed on there too. So you can have a variety of symptoms. Most people associate facial features with FASD. And I'm here to tell you that is not something that you sh should be your number one symptom. Fetal alcohol syndrome, which is one of those specific diagnoses, does have some facial features associated with it, whereas the others do not and therefore are considered invisible disabilities. Behavior and emotional symptoms, there is a continuum of severity, which means there's not one diagnosis that's more severe than the other. They all have behavioral emotional impacts. Um, so severity does not depend on the diagnosis itself. It depends on what happened in the brain when it was developing and how supportive is the environment. The less disabling factors of the environment, the less symptoms you're going to see. So the more you're supporting and being accessible and inclusive, which I know all of you are, the less of those symptoms you're going to see. Facial features are only present in about 10% of the population. The other 90% are those kids that are having a really hard time or maybe not following directions like we expect them to, or are having an emotional dysregulation uh, period where they're throwing chairs or hitting friends or things like that. So these are, this is the or opposite could be internalizing a lot of their feelings and high anxiety and hiding under the table and things like that. Um, and those kids aren't getting identified because the cognitive impairment that they have is not severe enough to make us think, oh, I think that child might have an intellectual disability. Most of these kids do not have intellectual disabilities. Their cognitive impairment comes in a different form. Uh, prevalence of FASD in the United States is one in 20, and really it's more like one in 15, which means every single daycare that has more than 20 kids in it has at least one that has an FASD. The weighted estimate, which means like the more likely number is one in 10. So if you have 20 kids, that means two of them are at risk for an FASD. It is so very common. Um, as far as special communities go, 17% uh, of the foster system meets criteria for an FASD. So if you've got foster and adoptive children in your settings and they're having a hard time and you don't know how to support them, maybe you know think that they might have this underlying condition and treat it like they've got the underlying condition. 
And then one more little statistic that I think is important is that one in five prisoners meets criteria for an FASD. This is what happens when FASD is not identified and not supported. And this is very expensive for our state. <laughs> um, same with inpatient psychiatric stays, which we see a lot of those in our in our community. Alcohol is the worst thing that can be exposed to a pregnancy. And I'm talking worse than methamphetamines, worse than opioids, worse than cigarettes. Alcohol kills developing cells, which um, results in less cells in altered function. However, when you pair alcohol with other substances, you don't just add to the damage, you multiply the damage. Uh, which makes the the symptoms for that damage even worse. So here's some common teratogens is a clinical term that just means anything harmful that can be exposed to a pregnancy. So here's um, some other teratogens that you may have thought of, but I want to point out this one here that we don't talk about enough as a teratogen, and that's the cortisol exposure, trauma. Many of our kids that are in our centers have gone through enormous amounts of trauma, and so have their biological parents. Uh, what if mom doesn't know where her where she's going to sleep that night? because she doesn't have a home? What if she doesn't know how she's going to feed her children? So if there's extended secretions of this cortisol um, hormone, then it can cause uh, pretty extensive damage. But when you pair it with alcohol, it can cause even more damage. Miss and or missed diagnoses cause significant problems. A lot of the kids that we see end up getting um, a uh, I'm just letting everyone in just to let you know that people in the waiting room, I'm just going to let them all in. Um, people with FASD often come in to our clinic with an existing diagnosis of ADHD or a conduct disorder, maybe oppositional defiant disorder is a pretty common one. Um, and then typically they have some learning concerns as well. But again, those learning concerns are not the the most significant symptom because these are the kids that are having really um, unmet behavioral and emotional regulation needs. And so we see those symptoms uh, much easier. Uh, and so the next question you're probably thinking is, well, how much alcohol exposure does it take to cause a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder? And this is something that I want everyone to pay attention to because it's much less than what you're thinking. Um, this is the National Institutes of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, the NIAAA. They're the ones who tell us what one standard drink is. And so I just want to point out a couple on here. This is a beer, which is legal if you're over the age of 21. 12 ounces of beer is considered one standard drink. But notice what the alcohol content in it is. This is a 5% alcohol beer. If we're looking at microbreweries, which are very popular around the state, those alcohol content gets up to 9-10% sometimes. And so if you're drinking one beer thinking you're only having one standard drink and the alcohol content is high, then you are thinking the wrong way. You're actually drinking more than one drink. Same with table wine. This is five fluid ounces of table wine is one standard drink. If you go to a restaurant, they're going to say, do you want the nine ounce glass or do you want the smaller six ounce glass? And that again is more than one standard drink. As far as how much does it take to cause an FASD? More than minimal levels of prenatal alcohol exposure are either 13 drinks per month. So that's one tiny standard drink about every other day or more than two standard drinks at one time. So if you have one 12 ounce beer that is 10% alcohol by volume, and then you have another small drink, then you have met the minimum requirements to, to have, be at risk for exposing uh, a pregnancy to alcohol to the extent that it could cause a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. When you're looking for FASD among your um, caseloads and the kids that are in your uh, your 
preschools and things like that. And this goes for the, so this PA stands for prenatal alcohol exposure or prenatal substance exposure. That's the kids who are coming in um, that have tested positive for meth at birth, things like that. Uh, I think it's important to point out their strengths because this too often gets overlooked. And um, the truth is these kids have a lot of strengths. They're usually very friendly. They're often very likable. They're usually very verbal and easy to talk to, which can get them in trouble if you're trying to, you know, have a quiet class, but just understand that they may need more than one repetition of uh, the direction to be able to follow that direction. They're usually hard workers and very determined. Um, they're, they're great with populations that have similar thinking capabilities as they do. So smaller children, older adults can tend to make that connection with them. And then other kids with disabilities, they tend to forgive easily. That's the silver lining of having a memory impairment is <laughs> that a lot of times you forgive easily. They're very trusting. This can be a safety issue here. Uh, so we have to watch out for that. Um, and then I would say 95% of the kids that have come through my clinic have had some underlying talent, which is really fun to figure out. If you can figure out what their strengths are and build your um, your accommodations and your support based around those strengths, they are more likely to do better in your class. This slide has a lot of words on it, I know, but I just want to point out these are the things that we look for as far as impairment goes in our clinic. So we look for, do they have what's called a neurocognitive impairment? And underneath this uh, here in this box, you only have to have one of these listed underneath it to meet that criteria. We look for executive dysfunction a lot in our clinic. So those are the kids who have a hard time shifting their attention. They might have a hard time with transitions. They might have a hard time organizing um, or getting started on a topic. All of those are executive functions. And then they they would have to have an impairment in self-regulation. So mood or behavioral regulation, attention skills, or impulse control. You only need one of those three to meet criteria. The last one is they need to have a deficit in adaptive function. And on this one, it's a little different. You have to have two of the four listed underneath here. One of them has to either be a communication deficit or a social communication deficit. Um, the most common makeup of symptoms that we see in the clinic are executive dysfunction and or a learning impairment. So a child with an IEP or perhaps an IFSP, um, usually they're meeting all three of these mood regulations, self-regulations, um, although attention deficit is very common, as is anxiety. Uh, and then as far as adaptive function, we usually see social communication deficit and daily living deficits. And putting the pieces together is the key to doing what's called a differential diagnosis. And it will be really important for you all to, to um, understand what those pieces are that we're trying in the clinic trying to put together, because that'll help us a lot. Uh, if you can say, this is what I'm seeing, these are the symptoms that they're seeing. Common co-occurring diagnosis I've got listed here. Um, some that you may have noticed in your own kids uh, in your clinics are ADHD symptoms. We see a lot of um, autism-like symptoms when it's really not autism. Uh, sleep disorders are extremely common. About 90% of the kids that we see in the clinic have some kind of sleep disorder. The younger they are, so in infancy, that sleep disorder might not be as obvious, but when they hit about three, four years old, they're starting to have a really hard time napping. They don't sleep at night. Um, they may go to sleep, be able to fall asleep, but then they wake up in the wee hours of the morning. And then we see lots of uh, behavioral, emotional uh, impairments as well. And again, the reason we're seeing those symptoms is because the environment is not set up to um, be able to decrease the symptoms. There's still something disabling happening in the, in the environment. And our job as clinicians is to figure out what that is, figure out what the trigger is so that we can avoid those dis dysregulation symptoms. 
Um, I am currently working on a preschool screener that I can get to y'all. It's, it's, I'm really excited about it. This is um, something that is not happening in other states. So the fact that we're doing it in Arkansas, yay, we're top of the list here. <laughs> Finally in Arkansas, yay, uh, something to be proud of. But I will get that out uh, once we do have it uh, up and running. And it, it is a strengths-based screener, which means we're looking for what these kids are doing that make them um, wonderful kids. And there is a, a pattern to strengths that we see in FASD. So that will uh, help us identify and decrease the bias that is caused with behavioral symptoms. This is just a list of resources, and I can certainly get these slides to everybody, um, not a problem at all, but some resources in the state. That's our clinic there, arcsdrc.org, um, and then some national um, uh, uh, resources as well. Arkansas None for Nine is our state affiliate to the national organization, which is FASD United. Any of these will have um, more information. If this has made you think of a specific kid or maybe a handful of kids, please uh, reach out. <laughs> We're happy to um, tell you more about it. And uh, yeah, I, I tried to keep it short. I tend to talk long. And it, do we have time for questions? Is there an do? Um, is that something that typically happens on here, some questions? Usually they put them in the chat box. So please, I welcome, and I think Dr. Cleveland is welcoming questions. Um, feel free to drop a question in the chat box and we'll monitor that. Um, and thank you so, so very much. We look forward to the screener. Uh, that's very exciting. And you're right. Uh, yay for Arkansas for being a leader. <laughs> Um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thanks again for letting me come and just give a little bit of information on a big topic. There's more yeah. to for sure. Uh, happy to help wherever I can. All right. I don't see any questions yet, but we'll keep monitoring for that. I'm going to, oh, here's one. How can we utilize this? I'm assuming parent consent would be required. So I'm thinking that Debbie's asking about the screener probably. And, you know, I would say, yes, as someone who's worked in a local program, you absolutely would want to have parent consent. So it might be something at the front end of your program when you're signing children up that you let your parents know about. Um, that this is just part of something that we do in our program. It's it's just a, you know, a part of our uh, menu of screeners that we use, um, but it is something that you would definitely want your parents to know and get sign off. Um, it could be an individual consent or it could be something that you do at the beginning, just that you that you're uh, going to consent to allow your child to be screened for a number of things. Um, Yes, I see. Yes, if Dr. Cleveland sends that, we will definitely be getting it out. And once she does, we'll probably have her come back if she's willing to and announce that and share it with us um, so that you all can utilize that tool. And if she has any additional information she wants to share, so definitely invite her back um, when she is ready to release that screener to you all. And uh, we will definitely put it on our website and share it that way if that's helpful for her. But um, we can definitely do that. And we'll keep monitoring for questions and just thank you again so much for your work in this space. It's a very big topic and a very important topic. And I know that many of the providers on here have probably had an experience um, and maybe don't even realize it with a child who's had this um, happening in their lives or haven't been diagnosed yet. We're gonna definitely. go ahead and- Thanks again. You bet. We're going to go ahead and move on. I think um, if you guys can advance the slides to the next one. Um, I'm going to talk just for a, a couple of minutes um, about actually three things. One is um, about transferring licenses. So uh, let me just make sure everybody understands. You, you cannot transfer your license to another person. Um, let's say that you're a price. So everybody who's in a school district or maybe uh, you know, another type of program. This is not necessarily in your world, but if you're a private child care provider and you own your building, you can sell your building. You know, that that is entirely your choice. But when you sell your building, you are not selling your license. That new entity has to get a license. Uh, we've had a few things happen and it's, it's probably just an anomaly, but I just wanted to make sure people knew, understand this and know this. Um, you know, if you're thinking about it, um, I'll tell you the thing that it can really impact. And if your facility takes 
any type of public funding. So if you take child care assistance and you take uh, or you have ABC, Arkansas Better Chance slots in your program, um, those do not transfer. So if you're in a situation and you're thinking about getting out of the business, please notify your licensing staff. If we can be in the front of it, we can help navigate it for families and make a transition a lot smoother. Many times we find out on the back end and we're and it really gets complicated um, and it can delay payments to a new provider. So what I'm telling you today is if you are going to sell your facility, you need to let the staff in child care licensing know immediately so that we can help you work through a process that will be more seamless for you, the new person who's purchasing your facility, and especially the children and families who may be impacted by such a thing. The second thing that's not on my list is we are seeing a situation where an individual has a maltreatment or an investigation happening. Um, and then they go from that facility to another facility and get hired. Um, please do reference checks. Please, please, please. We are trying to notify facilities when we identify this. I'm not aware that this has happened a lot in the past, but we are starting to see some things like that happen. So just make sure that when you're hiring people that you you might add to your we ask questions on our questionnaire like have you ever been terminated from a position you might want to say have you ever had a maltreatment investigation you know or are you currently in a maltreatment investigation i just want to make sure that you all don't get yourself into a situation with an individual who's going to bring a problem and potentially harm children at your facility. And I know none of you want that to happen either. So I just wanted to make you aware that we're seeing a little bit of an increase with that kind of thing. The last thing, and none of my things are probably popular today, guys. So I'm really sorry in December. We were notified last Thursday that there had been a duplicate payment on the childcare side. So if you take childcare assistance or vouchers, please check your banking information. If you have two amounts that are identical, there were about 445 providers that were um, in this duplicate payment. So if you had exactly the same payment, it is likely you received a duplicate. You do not have to do anything. We are not asking you to send that back. Please do not because the Department of Ed has let us know that they will net that against any future billing. So in other words, let's say you received two payments for $400 last week. You are billing this week for $400. They will net that against that $400 and you'll be even. So if you have questions, please call Laura Webb. I believe Laura's information is on the billing website. Again, this is only for providers that take childcare assistance. Just wanted to make sure you guys were aware of that. You're not in any trouble. It's an error on um, the agency side, and we do so apologize um, for that. We are continuing to work through processes as we are in this transition, and unfortunately, that one happened, and I, I do just so apologize on behalf of our finance colleagues and hope to get that all cleared out. But if you personally have a question about it, the best way to know is to go into your banking and see if you had two payments that were exactly identical, and that will help you know. Um, if you have a question about holiday billing, um, Brandy has put Laura's phone number in there. Thank you, Brandy. Brandy, if you can drop your email in for a question about holiday billing, I think that would take care of that question as well. And, and you can reach out to Brandy or Patricia, but she'll put that in and we'll help you with that. Same thing, Cheryl. So, Brandy, if you can drop in a staff contact for providers that are having problems. And, you know, just so you all know, I made this announcement last month, but if you are calling the office, we are in a very unique transition. We are at DHS still, so we're on their network, but we have to link into the Department of Ed's portal every day. And so phone calls that come into our office, if we're not sitting at our desk, they are not, they don't, we don't know where they go. But if you leave a message, it, we're not going to get it. 
the best way is to communicate via email. Just send an email and let us know um, that you're trying to reach someone about something. And we are getting our emails. Those are coming across. Even if you have it at the old DHS, it will still come to us at ADE. So do so apologize. As we get further into the physical transition of staff, I think things will smooth out, but it's still a little bit bumpy with the phone calls. And so I just want you all to know that I, I've heard a lot from people like I've tried to call that is not the best way to communicate with us now. If we're at our desk, we get the call, but if we're not, it is likely that it will roll into some place that we don't know and we don't get that missed call or missed message. So send um, send it via email um, to our email addresses and we should be able to communicate back with you. And we'll, we'll try to reach out and, and take care of anything. I'm gonna stop there because I think we have some other folks that are going to be speaking. So I've got Paige who is going to talk about uh, something that's very exciting. And we want to make sure that we announced it really more broadly this year. And we want lots of people to nominate. Um, sometimes we don't get that many nominations. But I know with the 129 people on this call that all of you have an outstanding early childhood professional at your facility. Um, and we just want you all to nominate those incredible individuals that are working with children every day. And so that we can really have a hard job of selecting the outstanding early childhood professional in Arkansas. So Paige, you want to talk about the process, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Can you guys hear me? Okay, good, because, because my microphone was not working earlier. So um, I echo what Tanya said. She basically said exactly what I was going to say to you guys is that this, we, I am excited that um, we're able to give the opportunity for you all to nominate um, again the, for the Arkansas Outstanding Early Childhood Professional of the Year. We've actually been doing this since 19, just looked at it, since 1988, we have been um, handing out this, this award. And over the past few years, we've really made an effort to um, engage the people who are selected to so that they can help support us on um, our early education uh, committees. This year, the nominations are due by January 31st, um, and we are encouraging you to nominate. Um, it, it can be anyone who is, in, but primarily, it's typically teachers who have offered direct care to children, but it can be anyone on staff. We've um, we've seen nominations for, for example, uh, you might have a curriculum coordinator who works with all the teachers at your facility. But we're, we are looking for people who um, you, you would want to represent you. You would want to represent you on a state level um, who've been in the field for um, at least three years and who plan on continuing to work in the field. Um, so we have an application process. I will drop a link here in a second in the chat for you all. And I'm also going to provide you with my telephone number and email address if you have any questions. And um, Kelly Hilburn, who's not with us today, um, someone else you can reach out to. So I um, just wanna highly, strongly, really encourage you to take this opportunity to um, support people who you work with and to show them your appreciation for the work that they do for our children and our families. Thanks. Thanks, Paige. She's going to drop some information in the chat box so that you'll have access to the process, but just encourage you all to nominate uh, one of your staff or colleagues. Um, it's a great opportunity. And so next, and certainly not least, um, Alicia Atwood is going to talk about Pre-K Rise. I'm just going to make a couple of comments. First of all, Alicia is amazing. For any of you who have worked with her on literacy training, uh, she truly is. She's been a teacher and uh, if I had a young child and she was teaching, I would want her in my classroom. Uh, she really knows her stuff, but I just want to share for those of you who are taking public funds, as we go forward, 
this literacy training will become a requirement. So this is an opportunity for you to go, hey, let's just go ahead and start that and get that done. Uh, it's been offered and Lori and Alicia have been a part of this call for the last uh, year or two years and sharing this um, with programs to encourage them. But we just wanted to do a push and I really wanted to make sure you're aware that the language in the Learns Act, uh, it's, it's certainly, there's a lot of language about literacy um, and literacy supports across the pre-K into K-12 spectrum, but we're really going to be pushing that in the early childhood side to support the literacy language development of young children. That is foundationally where it happens. So, Alicia, I'm going to let you take the mic and share information and just encourage programs, all of you, to take advantage of this incredible opportunity. Well, thank you, Tanya. It's so nice to be on the call today um, and to share this information. I am Alicia Atwood and a longtime early childhood educator. It is my passion and I do love literacy so much. Um, so I have been working here at the Department of Education. This is my third going on three and a half years. And um, we have worked, I've worked with Lori Bridges on the Pre-K RISE initiative. A lot of our educators have heard of the RISE initiative. It's the K-2 or 3-6 RISE initiative. Um, but Lori and I have been working on the Pre-K RISE um, initiative. And so I wanna tell you a little bit more about that today. There are two phases of the uh, Pre-K RISE initiative and I am gonna share my screen. Um, Tanya, can you see our web page? I can, yes. Okay, perfect. So if you, and I'm going to put these links in the chat in just a second, um, but if you go to www.prekrise.com, you will find this web page, and it tells you a little bit about the Pre-K Rise initiative, and I will tell you, um, phase one is the implementation of a literacy curriculum and we have about a thousand classrooms around the state that are implementing that do an amazing job and then phase two is what we're going to talk about today because we have a wonderful opportunity coming up starting in January um, for teachers and lead lead teachers and classroom teachers of preschool students to take the letters for early childhood development court, professional development course. So if you go to the Pre-K Rise website, it's going to tell you a little bit about our initiative. We're, we're going on three years. We've had a thousand um, that are about to finish. Um, we have a fall cohort that's going on right now. And in this, you're really going to learn a lot about, it's not going to teach how to teach kids to read, but it's really going to focus on what do kids need to know before that? You know, we focus a lot on phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, oral language, all of those things that we know start early on and that our kids have to have before they walk into a kindergarten classroom and start doing decoding work. So if you have a teacher that would like to participate in this training, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how to find out more information. So if you go over here to this um, left-hand column and you go to phase two letters for early childhood and you click that little um, carrot there, it'll drop down and give you some more information. Now, if you're wanting, if you know somebody who's interested in wanting to sign up for this, they would go here to this spring 2024 letters timeline to kind of find out you know, what do I have to do and what's the timeline um, that I would have to follow to be able to participate in this course? And then um, we're taking registrations right now and we will start the first live virtual session in mid-January. So you would probably need to sign up before that to make sure you get in all your virtual training sessions. So all of that information can be found there down there, there's another great, um, I know there's a, you probably have a lot of questions. So we've got an FAQ page here that tells you what does letter stand for? What is that? Well, it's the language essentials for teachers of reading for early childhood teachers. And you can go down this list of, of frequently asked questions and find out, you know, is this course right for me? Is this something that um, 
I would be interested in doing or one of my teachers would be interested in doing. And then we also have a very helpful document right here, the estimated time to complete each of the requirements. This is a layered professional development. And let me tell you what that means. When you register for the prof professional development, you will get a book that looks like this. And I know it's a little blurry, um, but it's the manual that goes along with the online coursework. Um, there's videos and little activities that you complete online. Um, and then there's a virtual training that teachers would attend um, for three hours once a month for four months. I know that's a lot, but it would be a total of uh, 12 of the hours of virtual training plus an hour and a half kickoff with Lori um, Bridges to kind of help teachers understand this this is a big elephant there's a lot of moving parts to this so we spend about an hour and a half helping our educators know exactly what this course is all about and then you take those virtual trainings so this is a layered professional development it has the reading it has the online coursework and then it has the virtual trainings um, that we c cover all of that great information and talk about that uh, with our colleagues around the state. So um, that I'm going to also share with you how to sign up. If you're interested, you would go to this letters right here for early childhood. And there's a there's the and I'm also going to put the PDF in the chat in case that's easier for you. It has lots of information. You would pick a cohort that you could attend those virtual trainings um, with that cohort. Now I will tell you, um, we have to limit these cohorts to 40 participants. So it does kind of fill up quickly. So go ahead and fill out the registration form here if you're interested. And it may be that we have to prioritize. Um, we wanna get as many teachers into this course as we can. Um, but don't worry, like Tanya said, we're going to have a lot of opportunities for you to be able to take this course. And Lori and I are talking about even maybe some additional uh, just to, uh, trainings coming up just to kind of help all the teachers that want to have this course have access to it. So the registration form looks like this. It's a Google form that you'll fill out and submit that to me. You'll get a copy in your email and then you'll hear from our office in a couple of weeks about what cohort you were accepted into. And there's that FAQ document again that I wanted to make sure you guys had access to. So I'm gonna turn this back over to Tanya and then um, if you have any questions, I'll hang around and make sure that um, I can get those answered for you. Thanks, Alicia. I saw a couple of questions about time frame, and I know that was in the slide. It looked like there were some late afternoon, um, early evening time frames. Uh, but if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to Alicia. Um, her email is, I think, in the chat box, or it can be put in there. Um, thanks, Paige. Paige has been so good to drop things in, so we appreciate you, Paige, for putting things in for us. Um, including some of the information for Alicia. So if you're interested in that, just again, there is no race to do this. We're just putting it in front of you. We're all gonna be working towards this. It's really all about preparing our children or making sure our children have access to highly trained teachers who have had this exposure to high quality literacy training um, for those children to be uh, more prepared for kindergarten. So we will make sure that you're going to get it. Um, Alicia, is there anything about this? Like this is for four-year-old teachers or if I remember, it was a little more geared towards four-year-old teachers. It really and, is. Okay. That's okay. correct. And the curriculum too is designed to be implemented the year before kindergarten. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to make sure you guys know that this wouldn't necessarily be for your infant and toddler classrooms, but it could be for your pre-K, um, particularly for your old classroom. So be thinking about that at your facility. And again, this is something as we move forward in time that will become a requirement, but we will work with you. We know it's gonna take a process to give everyone an opportunity to complete it, but it will be a required training 
for programs who take public funds uh, from the Office of Early Childhood. So um, just wanted to make sure you're aware of that and really appreciate Alicia for sharing today. Um, I think that might be it, but if we could go, yeah, I think I'm wrapping up, gang. So um, maybe a little bit early, but first of all, just thank you all from the bottom of our hearts here in the Office of Early Childhood for everything you do every day for children. Um, at this time of the year, as we're closing out a year and starting a new year um, and getting ready for the holidays and kids get a little antsy and, and we've had a little break and now we're getting ready for another one. But just want to really tell you guys, hang in there for a few more days. Hopefully you'll get a little break in between somewhere and it'll get quiet and you'll be able to refresh. But just thank you all so much for everything you're doing for children, everything you've already done and everything you'll be doing as we move forward. We really do appreciate you and, and just want you to have a good holiday season. Uh, keep in touch with us. Uh, the call's recorded, so it'll be on the website, and uh, Ashlyn's put it on the slide so that you can access it. Um, once it gets uploaded, you'll be able to listen. If you are not able to be on or you have colleagues that aren't able to be on, um, they can hop on and, and listen to this, the recording of this and uh, have access to the information. But everyone have a safe and happy holiday seasons, and we appreciate each and every one of you. Take care.